feel quite honored to have the privilege to welcome back Kate Ringland. Kate is one of our PhD alums from a couple of years back. Uh, since uh, her time here at UCI in informatics, she's been a postdoc at Northwestern University and now is currently a presidential uh, postdoc at UC Santa Cruz in the computational media department. Her work touches on a, on a bunch of different areas, but is broadly focused on studying and designing for people uh, with disabilities in particular focused on social computing systems that really bridge online and offline interaction uh, for people with disabilities. And her work has been widely recognized with best paper awards and honorable mentions at, at some of the, the top venues in HCI like CHI and Assets and UBCon. Um, with that, I will I will turn it over to you, Kate. Let's give her a warm welcome. See if successfully share the screen twice. All right. Okay. Uh oh. Oh, okay. Messages popping up. Okay. So yeah, thank you for that introduction um, and welcome to my talk, Accessing Caring Community in Playful Spaces. Uh, all right. Every part of this soil is sacred in the estimation of my people. Every hillside, every valley, every plain and grove has been hallowed by some sad or happy event in days long vanished. I was chief Seattle in 1854. So I'd like to start today by acknowledging the land that I am currently on which is in, within the ancestral territory of both the Suquamish and Duwamish people. So they're ex expert fishermen, canoe builders, cultural leaders, and others that have lived in harmony with the land that surrounds the Salish Sea for thousands of years and continues to maintain that balance today. And it is our duty in the spirit of their ancestors to protect the land and water for future generations. So I also encourage you to learn about the ancestral land that you are currently residing on and a long history of broken treaties and failed policies and how you can become an ally for tribal justice. And with that, for those who don't know me, my name is Kate Ringland and I am currently UC President's Postdoc in Computational Media at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I am available across a wide variety of platforms. It's probably best to reach me either on Twitter at L-I-L-T-O-V-E or um, at my address. <laughs> Um, via email. And I do encourage you even after this talk to reach out to me if you um, want to continue some of these conversations that we're going to have today. So in this talk, I'm going to be giving a little bit of intro about myself and my background and kind of how I came to this research space. Um, and then I'm going to be going into a couple of different kind of very different projects that I've worked on and then kind of bring them together at the end and how um, we can take these ideas and move forward and talk a little bit about my ideas for future research, but I'd also love to chat with other folks about their ideas for where some of this work can go. So I'm gonna be first talking about uh, a project that, taught, that was in collaboration with a hospital system looking to um, patient mental health care. And then I'm gonna be talking about some of my art craft work with some of you here might be familiar with. Um, and all, it's around an online community for uh, autistic children centered on the game Minecraft. All right, with that, talk a little bit more about me. So some of my personal background, um, I grew up in Southern California before I moved to the Pacific Northwest. And I had the privilege of growing up around computers and was taught things like programming language uh, at a very early age, which was unusual for the time. And I was also kind of instilled with a love of games. I had older cousins who went on to form Bay 12 games and create Dwarf Fortress. And so I feel like I've kind of been grown up around this idea of playful community and game spaces uh, my whole life. And I, I, there's a stark contrast in how I've chosen to pursue kind of these passions around games uh, versus say my cousins where I, I'm a woman with disabilities. And this has really kind of been the driving force for a lot of the work that I do. So I received my undergraduate degree um, 
in uh, Washington State University at Vancouver in psychology and then obviously went on to do my informatics PhD at Irvine. And so I have kind of this really wide breadth of background that's informing a lot of the work that we're gonna see here today. And then went on and did my postdoc at Northwestern and simultaneously uh, started a nonprofit um, around uh, doing research with indigenous tribes, which I'll talk about at the end. And then I came here to Santa Cruz. And by here, I mean virtually, because I'm not actually in Santa Cruz. All right. <clears throat> so with that, let me go into a little bit more detail about kind of my research orientation. Um, and then we'll hone in on a couple of the research projects and talk about those. So in my work, I'm interested in bridges. I'm interested in bridges as this metaphor um, for how we think about technology. So bridges can solve problems. They can help us get from one place to another. Bridges help us overcome obstacles and they help make things that might have seemed impossible, possible. They also give us a new perspective. So bridges allow us to see what it looks like at the intersection of two points, but it also makes that intersection of two points look different. So in my work, I study bridges, perhaps not physical bridges, but I'm interested in how tech can act as a bridge for people. So various types of technology can be a better bridge for achieving goals, to living a better life, to building community, to social interactions. And just like physical world bridges, we must also understand when it's time to redesign and rebuild. We must be in a constant state of making the system better because sometimes it doesn't work quite as expected. So I, as a researcher and community member, want to understand when it's time to improve upon the design and rebuild systems. And so this work sits kind of at the, the intersection of a lot of, of different areas. And so I also see myself as a bridge to these different connections. So fields like human computer interaction, accessible technology, games and media studies, and education. And with my background in psychology, computer science and informatics, I really take that expertise and bring it back into deep community engagement. So I'm working with, uh, in partnership with different communities. And I really think about how my expertise can really be used to help these communities. So with that, I'll jump right into this first research project. So this, this research project is kind of going to help me set the stage for the second and help me set the stage for kind of the overall uh, kind of thrust of this talk, I guess. So I know I had the word playful in the title of this talk, and this project doesn't actually really fit into that very well. Um, but it does a lot of the work uh, that we need in order to understand why playful communities are a vital part of the fabric of people's lives, especially in the context of disability and mental health, which I'll get into. So in this work, uh, I worked with a team of postdocs and undergrads to understand how care managers and patients interact within a large um, hospital system in the Chicago area. So we were interested in particularly um, these care managers whose job it was to manage and coordinate care of high risk and high utilizer patients. So people who made frequent visits to the ER and things like that. So these care managers were in charge of these patients and in charge of kind of coordinating all their care. And we really wanted to dig into how they currently are managing mental health and what kind of some of the technological needs might be for this group of people. Um, so in this study, we conducted uh, workshops with these care managers at three different locations across the Chicago area. Um, these were groups of four or five care managers and they consisted of nurses and social workers. So we brought them together to um, ask them questions around what their job was, what they were, what they were comfortable, uncomfortable with in terms of specifically dealing with mental health care of their patients and then to get a better understanding of their workflow and actually have them sit down and sketch out some of these processes and, and how they actually manage their patients. And then we really wanted to get an idea of 
through that how technology might be used as an intervention to help them do their jobs better. Basically. So in this work, we, we had the transcripts from the actual discussions, but then we also collected these, I'm calling them sketches, although they were mostly um, these kind of diagrams that you see here on the, on the slide where people would write out words and then there'd be arrows to indicate like either workflow or how, how they envisioned patients to um, be getting the different resources they were providing and so on and so forth. And so we really looked at these um, sketches at the same time we were looking at um, the transcripts of, of these uh, workshops that we ran. Um, and one of the big things that we found in uh, kind of the, 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 the big overall takeaway was there's actually a large discrepancy in the actual training of the care managers. Um, so their training levels and education around mental health care. So some were really well versed in mental health care. They were especially um, those with the social work background had um, a better idea of what was going on in terms of how to care for mental health. But others were really deeply uncomfortable with caring for those with um, mental ill health. So in this hospital program that we were working with, before we could even consider the introduction of new technology, we had to take a step back and actually think about how the care managers were being trained. And um, so that is actually in progress right now, actually training the care managers and kind of bringing everybody up to the same level in terms of how they actually do their jobs. Um, but to, that's to say, this is still a really great opportunity for technology because past research has shown that technology can act as a supportive tool for people with mental ill health, uh, but there's lots of issues around adoption and using it long-term and, and thinking through how the care managers think about this technology. And so there's a lot of more open-ended questions about this, but I wanted to, in this work, take a pause and think, okay, Perhaps technology is not always the solution to some problems and that's that's totally fair. Um, so I, I really wanted to stop and say, okay, how do we understand the larger ecosystem that this technology is residing in, the technology we we're hoping to create, for example? How do we understand what is actually happening um, at the different layers of the community that these care managers and patients were living in? Um, so in other words, when is it actually necessary to build a bridge or what kind of bridge is even needed in this space? And so that led me to the question of how are we actually understanding what mental health means here? How do we think about this in terms of the medical system? How are we thinking about um, the different ways we can um, approach mental health? And so I decided to think about what does mental, mental health look like if we're taking this um, at a disability lens, because that's my, my background and expertise. So in other work under the same project, um, I started thinking um, from the patient perspective, what does disability um, and mental illness, how does that intersection happen? So disability to define it is when a person is denied access to an activity, experience or interaction. That is a person is not necessarily inherently disabled, rather the, the environment is disabling them. And that, that, that's an important factor in how we understand disability and how we approach it. So things like disability and access as two different concepts really go hand in hand. So the, how we understand what is accessible and what is disabling, these, these ideas are not static things. So they're dynamic and ever shifting depending on the social circumstances and context in which they're situated. So how society decides to build its environment, what we as a society decide is normal impacts who has access at any given time to, to any particular thing. So society is what ultimately deems whether a person is disabled or not, or has access or not. So the classic example is, uh, the, when someone is using a wheelchair and they want to participate um, in something that's happening at the top of a flight of stairs, but they can't because there are stairs in the way and their wheelchair can't traverse the stairs. Uh, this is a really kind of obvious and simplified example and it is actually quite a lot more complicated than this, but this kind of gives you an idea of 
how people make decisions that can impact those who want to participate in the things happening around them. A more subtle example might be, for example, in the United States, if an individual finds making eye contact painful, as it can be for a lot of folks, including autistic people, they might find it difficult to get a job. So an employer might diligently put in ramps for physical access to their site of employment, but they still pass on an interviewee who doesn't make eye contact with them during a job interview. So then for the purposes of this, this research, we can think of uh, mental ill health then under this idea of disability. And I've classified this all under the term psychosocial disability. There's lots of different terms that um, get used out there, but I'm sticking to this one because it helps keep things simple. So psychosocial disability then um, includes things such as anxiety, depression, other mental health concerns, and those can all kind of fall under this umbrella of psychosocial disability. So this recognizes actual or perceived impairment that these concerns produce in daily life. So such, such disabilities might manifest in a relation to like a diversity of different experiences. So mental, emotional, and cognitive experiences all kind of fall under this umbrella. And it's important to note that a large portion of the world's population, um, one in four, actually falls under uh, this category as, as folks who are just diagnosed with various mental health conditions. Um, and then that's not even including the many more people who probably don't meet the medical threshold for diagnosis, but are nevertheless impacted in their daily lives. So circling this back around to the care managers, um, I have found that with the care managers and the patients, they're all trying to work and thrive in a system that's largely ill-equipped for dealing with kind of more expansive mental health care. So thinking about systemic ableism, um, this also makes their jobs as carers and people needing care more challenging. So internalized ableism, for example, meant that patients who were less likely uh, patients were much less likely to admit to having a mental health condition or to seek out care for those challenges. And care managers also struggled with their own ableism in making assumptions about whether patients were truly suffering from mental ill health or if they were, say, just being lazy, in quotes. And then finally, the medical system itself does not, at the moment, prioritize mental health care in the same way that does other physical health. So there's a dearth of clinicians and providers that can actually see patients. So even if the care managers are confident in their next st steps in what a patient needs to do for their mental health care, um, there's very little or no one and nowhere to actually refer them to. So the case of the care manager shows that without understanding um, without this kind of lens of mental ill health under this umbrella of psychosocial disability or understanding the ableism in the context of the larger healthcare system, those designing technology could easily unintentionally perpetuate and reinforce the systemic issues that are keeping people from finding relief to their pain or solutions to the frustrations brought on by living in a society that marginalizes them. Which leads me straight to my next, next example online community for autistic children. So again, ableism, that's the discrimination against disabled individuals is prevalent throughout society. So this isn't just a say medical system problem. And whether intentional or not, acts of ableism are acts of violence. And this violence causes trauma for those who experience it. So as designers, developers, and researchers, we have to be cognizant of this in order to not cause further violence or trauma to already oppressed communities, including those from the disabled community. So I'm gonna kind of dig into this idea a little further. So autistic children are often considered antisocial or not interested in making friends. And this is because these children have a very difficult time with face-to-face -face conversations, for example. Um, the amount of information might be overwhelming. They can become stressed or anxious in these situations. But this is a problem because children need social play. They need social interaction and playful experiences. That's how they 
uh, develop. It's how they practice their social skills. Children engage in a wide range of playful practice roles and test out the boundaries of different social rules. And these playful interactions are vital not only for the children to have fun, but also to grow into you know, competent adults and to figure out who they are and who they want to become as adults. However, these autistic children are finding themselves bullied in various places, uh, school, for example, and they tend to get singled out because they're different. And then what's happening is these kids are then feeling isolated and they're going to online spaces to try to find places to play um, and they're meeting more trolls and bullies there. So of course, going online means different kinds of dangers for children, especially. There's lots of different content out there. Uh, there's um, people that can actually end up having a significant impact. Um, parents and caregivers are kind of warned of all these dangers and there's this kind of you know, overwhelming amount of information that we're supposed to be looking out for and, and keeping track of. And the tendency then is just kind of lock everything down because there's just so much to worry about. And the dangers of bullying and harassment are very real for any child on the internet from both strangers and peers, but this then becomes especially true for children with psychosocial dis disabilities or autistic children that I'm talking about today. So for example, um, not only are there these concerns about these outside threats to disabled children, but then there's also the tensions that parents have to navigate within their own online activities. So uh, parents using online platforms to seek support in um, raising their kids, risk exposing their kids' um, own private information to the internet, further stigmatizing their disabled children and so forth. And so what happens is with this stigma, um, autism then tends to become this kind of target. So a lot like other marginalized groups, you see things like autism or autistic actually being used as a derogatory slur. And you see this especially in gaming spaces. Um, um, it's, it's thrown out there as a slur quite a lot. Uh, and then threats of violence can be found across the internet, um, including in, in various places that these, these children are frequenting like YouTube video comments and things. I'm, I'm sure everyone here has probably experienced something like this on the internet. So for example, on one YouTube video about, um, this was a video about uh, Minecraft for autistic kids. A commenter left the following comment, probably the wrong place to say it, but autist people should not live. What people call love and humanity are just really intricate instincts and neural connections, but still they are sentient. And for some reason, I am happy that they can get help like this. So luckily, in this particular example, this was like the one negative comment out of a whole bunch of positive, but it's still sitting there on YouTube. Um, and this is the sort of thing that these kids are getting exposed to as they go to try to find content um, relevant to themselves and their community. And this is especially meaningful as research has shown that the experiences that someone has in these online spaces can be as impactful to them as what is happening to them in physical spaces. And as I will talk about more in a minute, these threats of violence have real physical harm for these children. So harassment, threats of violence, um, comments about autistic people killing themselves, all of this um, has a large impact on those being targeted. So we're talking about additional stress, psychological harm. And this harm doesn't stop with the verbal and written threats. Like other marginalized communities, those with autism face the very real threat of physical violence against them because of this rhetoric that's out there. Luckily, uh, people have used these online spaces like video games to also, also push back against this kind of negative behavior and rhetoric. So today I'm talking a little bit about the Autcraft community, which is the first Minecraft server dedicated to providing a safe, fun learning environment for children on the autism spectrum and their families. That's what it says on their website. So it's run completely by parent volunteers and it's sustained from donations by community members. Um, the server welcomes children with autism, their family and friends. So kind of autistic children and allies. 
So this takes place in uh, the Minecraft virtual world for the most part. The community does use, as I mentioned, YouTube and other uh, social media on top of Minecraft to kind of create this whole community system. Um, but primarily the, the play is happening inside the Minecraft world. So I kind of follow them to their world to kind of find out what was going on. So for those who don't know, Minecraft is this, is sort of like virtual Legos. It's this big open-ended world that's kind of all created out of blocks. And you can dig up the blocks and you can place blocks and you can create objects out of things and really your imagination and you know what pixels are on the screen kind of, it's kind of unlimited in the things you can do. Um, so you can create houses, castles, you know, kind of whatever you can think of and you can go on adventures. And it's, uh, it's a little bit more accessible, especially for younger children, because it is this um, fairly simple UI and it's not, it's not got complicated things like Second Life. You don't have to worry about programming languages or anything if you don't want to. Um, so it's, it's really great for younger children. And then there's these avatar interactions that you're seeing on the screen here. And then there's also text chat and that's the primary way to interact in the space. So in this community, the, the bulk of the community members are mainly preteens who have some kind of autism or similar diagnosis, but it also ranged from children as young as, as six all the way into adults. Um, it's also important to note that often the an avatar in the world would not necessarily map to one person in the physical world. So we see a lot of instances of younger children, like you see on the slide here, a child sitting on a parent's lap and kind of playing together or siblings taking turns with um, a single account or whatever. So as you're playing, you kind of have to check in to see who you're actually talking to. Uh, everyone on the server speaks English, uh, but there are uh, groups from all over the globe. So North America, the UK, and Australia were kind of the main uh, main groups of players, but there are people from all over. So in this work, I used ethnographic methods, including participant observation and interviews to conduct my work. Uh, I used the username researcher Kate. Uh, I was really interested in making it very clear who I was and why I was in this space. So I kind of announced myself before I ever entered the space and I posted to all their different social media and really invited questions from parents and kids. I created this avatar um, that you see here on the screen. Uh, I dressed myself in a white lab coat. I look sort of similar as much as you can in a, for a Minecraft, blocky Minecraft character to what I look like in the physical world. Um, I was very concerned about visibility and making sure that uh, people kind of could recognize me and also to kind of evoke curiosity and have them actually ask me who I was and why I was there. Um, and this helped kind of seed some of the conversations that I would have with the kids while I was playing. So it was nice in that the virtual world did really afford me this opportunity to kind of pick and choose what I looked like and how I presented myself. Uh, one of the things I wanted to note is that doing this work in the Minecraft world is very different from a lot of other places on the internet because it really does have this inherent sense of place. So in many ways doing this work was a lot more like doing work in a physical space. So say conducting participant observation at Legoland versus studying a Facebook page. So it really had that really inherent um, sense of place to it. So one of the important aspects of the community is that there's a, a vetting process and a, and a way to kind of create safety for the community. So the players all apply before they're allowed into the system. So they apply through this little application process. And then as they're granted access, they're put on this whitelist. And that's what actually allows them to access the game. So this gatekeeping practice ensures that players have a connection to the autistic community, meaning that they have autism or there's a family member or a close friend um, who's already in the community uh, with autism. So there's that connection there. And typically this process occurs after they um, kind of fill out this form and then they, they're kind of checked. So um, 
so so they're actually looked there's a like a, a name for the, or a list for usernames to make sure that the their username hasn't been used for like nefarious purposes on other minecraft communities and things like that so allowing only those with this direct connection to the autistic community um really helped ensure the safety by allowing players to um be a little bit more open within the community about um their own autistic idea and to kind of remove some of that fear of um, stigma and other things. And so, like I said, they're checked to make sure that they're not like on any known like troll lists or things like that. Um, so one group of individuals that's really explicitly excluded here uh, is those kind of people who have nefarious uh, intentions or those trolls and people who actually really mean harm to autistic players they're like the the one group that's really explicitly uh denied access to this play space so large portions of the uh community of autcraft are pre-adolescent and adolescents um, with autism and as such they're acutely aware of the fact that they feel and seem different from their peers so there's a lot of issues and concerns around loneliness and bullying and so these players are really seeking out the Otcraft community in order to relieve their own loneliness, to find like-minded peers and to really find that sense of community. And as I played in the Otcraft world, I got to talk to lots of different players and join in their games. And I was invited um, to do things like hide and seek and play paintball. And I was really able to kind of go and see their creations. So as I was um, doing interviews, they would actually take me to their places and, and show me around. And so one such place was this kind of entire university where the classrooms have these positive messages about behavior uh, around things like self-soothing, uh, things that children might find themselves being uh, picked at or bullied at um, about in other uh, contexts or situations. So for example, um, in one of the classrooms, a sign read, what's the problem with body listening? Eye contact can be physically painful for some. You don't have to look to be good at listening. Your ears can do their job all by themselves. Sometimes verbal stims help to process and that's okay if making sounds helps you listen and learn. Flappy hands, happy hands. Your boundaries are just as important as anyone else's. Your brain is always thinking even when others don't understand. You are awesome just the way you are. Your heart is caring about others and you deserve the same. And then in another room, there was this statue named Larry. And the sign says, this is Larry. Larry used to sit, shame autistics about who uh, about whole body listening, but now he knows better. Larry is working on his assumptions about autistics. Share this with others to help them learn. So Larry here is representative of somebody that, um, that these kids know most likely outside of the Otcraft community. Uh, but they know in their day-to-day -day lives. So perhaps Larry is a fellow student at school or he's the grocery store clerk or he's the dentist. And autistic players often run into those sorts of people who are judging them for their behavior. And in this school, there's this kind of lesson around, it's okay to educate Larry, here's how, what we might say to him to help him understand us better and so that you know he can stop judging us basically. And so within the Otcraft community, there's this very strong sense of this autistic identity and kind of pushing back at, against a lot of the ableism and stigma. So throughout the world and through the player interactions, you can find these messages of acceptance uh, and understanding and this really idea of self-advocacy. And so to help reinforce this, Otcraft has very specific rules that everyone follows in order to keep themselves safe. And these include things like no name calling, no giving out private information. And as it says on their website, on Autcraft, we try to conduct ourselves based on three major principles, be kind, be respectful, and be responsible. But as I said earlier, there's this very real potential for harm if these kids are playing in unsafe places. So in fact, the language that continues to put those with disabilities down is what gives some people the, in the physical world the green light to be violent. So what really drove this home for me was this memorial that was set up to honor disabled people and children murdered by filicide in the United States. So this parent brought me to um, this secret vault he had created. Uh, and if you wanna mute the audio for the just the next couple of slides, this is 
possibly a trigger warning for some people. So just it's just like two slides, and then you can you can unmute again. So he showed me this vault um, as he was giving me a tour of his larger building. So we walked through a locked door and then down a really long hallway. And then at the end of the hallway, it opened up into this really big, bright chamber with these kind of tall cathedral ceilings. And inside the chamber were these rows and rows of illuminated blocks that gave kind of this appearance that the, that the walls were made out of glass. And then wandering up and down these rows were these brightly colored sheep of different, there was like rainbow of different colored sheep kind of wandering in and out of the aisles. And so he had built this hauntingly beautiful memorial to those who had been victims of filicide. So row after row contained these signs um, with names and ages and dates of disabled people who had been killed by a family member. And he had painstakingly recorded the names of approximately 420 victims from 1980 to 2016. So I asked him where he got this list of names and he was apparently the chapter coordinator for the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, and they had sent him the list. And the Autistic Self Autism Self-Advocacy Network uh, provides this kind of anti filicide toolkit on their website. And this actually coordinates with the Disability Day of Mourning. Um, which is March 1st. And that's when people are asked to remember and commemorate those with disabilities who have lost their lives at the hands of loved ones. So this is a secret space. It's kept away from especially the younger children in the community, but it nevertheless stands as kind of this reminder that there's a very real threat to the safety of the members in this community. And there's a very real raw trauma that is still here for them. And so while this memorial can kind of be seen as a place of sadness and mourning, there's also a sense of pride here. So pride in the beauty of the architecture, which this parent had designed and built single handedly, but also pride in the sense of belonging to the Autcraft community and to the broader community of autistics. So if the educational classrooms um, from earlier invoked the sense of learning to accept and be accepted as someone with autism, then this memorial invoked a sense of that while others may hurt you, be it physically or emotionally, you are not forgotten and that you have a safe place to belong, albeit in these online spaces. So autistic youth, youth and even adults come to the Autcraft community largely with stories of bullying, abuse and trauma, and they have felt alienated or openly ostracized in other gaming communities. So they see and hear their diagnosis being used as a slur. And for those who don't face physical violence, they aren't that far removed from it. And Autcraft has managed, even with a community membership of 14,000 plus at this point, to kind of create this place for their members to process their trauma, find a sense of community and just play and have fun, which is the real reason to be in Minecraft in the first place. So here, the technology of Minecraft, along with all the other social media they use, really helps be the bridge that brings the Autcraft community together. So a contribution of this work is to show that instead of using assistive technology, the term used broadly here, to only support specific social interactions, such as face-to-face -face interactions, technology can be used to mediate and support all kinds of different interactions and activities like you've seen. So I'm interested as, um, as I might get to later um, when I talk about future work, I'm really interested in this idea of these playful spaces such as Autcraft that can be especially useful in creating caring communities. So by helping to diffuse the seriousness through play, these communities can actually begin to collaborate to heal. And even as I was conducting this work and giving the community feedback about what I was finding, they were actually able to modify and rebuild the system in order to improve the experience for all the community members. So I really was deeply embedded and not just there to observe, but to help make changes and to help, um, help them do what they wanted with their community. So if we ask the question, why do we need to know about ableism and trauma in these communities when all we want to do is study technology? The answer is this, we need to know about ableism. We need to know about the trauma. 
once we know these things, we can do our utmost as designers, as developers, and as researchers to not reinforce and enable this trauma to continue. So when we build systems, we are baking in our biases and assumptions into them. And if the goal is to help these communities, then we need to make sure that we are not baking ableism into the tech as well. And so with that, um, I'm gonna give a little taste of some of my future research and then hopefully I'd love to open it up and, and, and take questions and, and chat with others about uh, places this might go. So I have, I have several different kind of strands going on or streams going on in my uh, work right now. So this is kind of building off of these different projects and really thinking about these ideas of play and, and community and caring and trauma. So these research streams include um, thinking about accessible and inclusive gaming for disabled players, um, technology and games to support indigenous communities and playful social media to support uh, caring communities. Um, so for example, there's a bunch of different projects that are either started or in the idea phase, but I'm still working on Minecraft for autistic youth in a couple of different ways. I'm thinking through um, work on kind of after school play spaces and before the pandemic, what did that look like when they were physically together? But now of course we're back to being all online at the moment. Um, games for indigenous communities, which I'll talk about in more detail in a second. And then thinking through things like K-pop fandom on places like TikTok. Um, and so let me dive into this uh, idea of um, games for indigenous communities for just a couple of minutes and then I'll wrap up. So I've actually been working through my nonprofit. I've been working with the Suquamish tribe, which is located uh, just across the water from Seattle uh, to work on kind of this idea of indigenous research and how we can uh, better support indigenous communities in the United States. So there's a, much like with ableism, there's a history of violence in indigenous communities that's the root of many contemporary challenges for them. Uh, so things like domestic violence, access to mental health care are often uh, problems that disproportionately impact indigenous people and indigenous women in particular. So I'm very interested in focusing in on um, some of these aspects of the community. So. The majority of currently proposed solutions focus on the medical aspects of trauma through a Western lens and then attempt to fit indigenous ideologies and cultures into that after the fact. And I'm interested in not doing that and reversing it a little bit and starting with an indigenous first approach. Uh, so this bridge is uh, an actual physical world bridge uh, that bridges the gap between or the, the, the land between um, Bainbridge Island where I'm actually currently living and the Suquamish tribe. And it's a really interesting stark contrast because Bainbridge Island is full of very affluent, uh, uh, well-resourced community, put it that way. And then, and then the Suquamish tribe is kind of the bridge in between. Um, so, so this begs the question is like, what can we do to help improve the resources on the other side of the bridge? How can we, um, really start thinking about what access to those resources might look like and give the tribe things that by right they should already have. So I'm working in partnership with this tribe to really think about, um, think about through, through ideas of their indigenous culture, what, um, what, what we can do to leverage uh, the idea of play in games. So I'm really interested in, uh, the cultural aspects where healing and care are already growing out of storytelling. This is something that's already there. And so how can we help create some infrastructure for places that say support uh, domestic violence help? How can we create infrastructure for them to actually leverage um, some of these ideas that are already a part of their culture and help bring, bring other experts who um, work with these groups, how do we bring them on board to the indigenous culture instead of the other way around? Um, so we're going to be focusing on this idea of healing trauma through storytelling and play. And as soon as the pandemic's over, I can actually do this. It was supposed to happen this year and, and then it didn't because 
this is a very physical world thing that I have to do. So anyway, so we're going to be actually getting in the space and seeing how they're already doing these things and then seeing how we can um, create kind of a fun game infrastructure around it. All right. All right. So with all of this research, um, I'm continuing to ask the question, um, what are the playful ways in which we can create these communities, both online and offline? And how do we use that to actually do this very serious work of care and support? And, um, and, and what are the different aspects that we can start thinking about? How can we start pushing back against things like ableism, for example? All right. And with that, I am super um, excited to take questions now. And do feel free, if you're not comfortable talking in this space, do feel free to reach out to me in, in other forms, such as on Twitter and or my email or wherever else you can find me. I'm happy to chat. And I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually see people. Let's all thank Kate. <laughs> so, so we have some time for, for questions, thoughts, um, feel free to use the chat, feel free to raise your hand. Um, there's also a, the Q&A feature. We'll, we'll take questions or comments in any form. Go ahead, Alana. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for the really great talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you more about uh, the mental health work that you did. And mm -hmm. um, I was really inspired of hearing how uh, you use the lens of ableism and looking at mental health. And right, it sounds like people suffer from um, this uh, ableism being present. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could speak more um, about how that was manifested and the things you saw in your study and what are some things you think we should be doing about yeah so so the way it manifested is possibly the ways you might imagine you know all the all the kind of tropes about crazy people and and or thinking about things like depression oh i'm just too lazy to get out of bed or um those sorts of things or I can get, I can, I can do this on my own. I don't need help with this. Um, so I don't need like medical care for this. This is something I should just be able to get over. All those kind of things um, really point back to especially like internalized ableism. Like I, you know, I should be able to do this. Why can't I do this? Well, I'm just gonna pull myself up and, and, and get it done. And then usually not be able to do that, of course. Um, and then on the care manager side, a lot of just assumptions about, you know, it's the not truly understanding, oh, that's anxiety or that's depression that's doing that and just thinking, oh, they're lazy or, oh, they just can't follow through or not really thinking about the fact that you're actually treating them for, for these concerns and yet you're still making these assumptions about why they're behaving this way. Yeah. And are there, are there things that, uh... You have uh, that you you would advise us to do work on to address these challenges. Uh, I'd love to chat more about that because yeah, I I'm at that point. I'm like, okay, well, we now know this is a thing. How do we deal with this? I mean, for these for the care managers especially, it really it really is just about training them to actually because a lot of them didn't have any background in mental health, and so they really didn't know. And so a lot of it is just training them to be sensitive and training them to understand kind of the underlying mechanisms behind what's happening. Um, and that's my hope that just that kind of simple step, simple, but you know, that that step will actually help alleviate at least some of the issues that they're having with their patients. Thank you. We should talk more about this. Yes, yes, we should. <laughs> I had a question. Can I jump yeah. in? Yeah. Hi, thanks, Kate, for this awesome talk. Uh, so my question was more on the healing trauma aspect of your work. Um, so you saw some of that through this materializing and working in art craft and, and doing that by building these virtual spaces, um, mostly kind of like 
co-creating the space and sharing the space, right? And mm -hmm. then you're kind of doing the same thing in, in the indigenous tribes. And then you talked about this really interesting thing, which was kind of um, um, taking, taking a different perspective than using the Western medicine style for dealing with trauma. So I'm curious yeah. as to like, do you see any tensions in this kind of this clinical um, approach towards trauma versus this community approach towards trauma, which is kind of this co-creation? Uh, yeah, there's a there's a lot of tensions there. I'm still, I'm I'm at the I'm at with that work uh, especially. I'm at the I'm at the I'm gonna sit down and shut up and try to understand what's happening your phase of the process. But um, yeah, there are a lot of tensions around. Um, especially with, with medical systems really abusing and um, victimizing indigenous groups. Um, there's just a huge distrust there. And then there's, there's, there's a lot of um, how, how Westerners approach healing is just simply different than how they as a community approach healing. And so, um, instead of trying to fit the Western ideology on top of that or in, into that or usurp that or whatever you want, whatever's going on there, um, really just bringing it back to, okay, what does the, com listening to the community and what does the community actually want here and need here, um, mm -hmm. rather than coming in, you know, in all my glory and telling them how they're gonna fix themselves. Yeah, it's really interesting because like I've, I've been working from the clinical perspective because collaborating mm -hmm. with clinicians and things like that. Um, yeah. And so there's always this notion of evaluating how your design is supporting somebody in that process. And so I was yeah. curious as to like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll wait and see how the project goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Great>. TBD. <laughs> We have time for a couple more questions if folks have questions. Dennis, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much for uh, this is an awesome talk. And uh, could you talk a little bit more about how like in the art crafts community, like how children um, and perhaps their caregivers or other, you mentioned about a lot of different stakeholders, like the families, mm -hmm. friends or caregivers or other um, other people who's in, mm -hmm. also in that server. So I was wondering, could you talk a little bit more about how this kind of play for interaction were facilitated inside of it? And what are some like major challenges you see in the, the community, like under that under the, the, the Minecraft um, structure or the game? Right, right. Yeah. So so inside the world, um, there is lots of different stuff going on um, The the it, I mean, if you didn't know any better, it would probably look very similar to like a regular server. It's just people going off and doing their thing and playing and like there's like, hey, we're putting a group together to go do X, let's all go do X. Um, so there's a lot of that going on, but there is um, there is some structure around uh, the, the the caregivers or admins that are kind of on at the moment, they, they, they will help instigate things. So they'll um, they'll be like, hey, you seem to be just chilling there. Do you want to keep chilling there? Or do you want to come play hide and seek or um, kind of try to, you know, uh, get people to play together and things like that. And then there's a lot of structure around um, pro-social behavior. So the server itself has all these messages that kind of go out periodically, things like don't forget to share or um, don't forget to say hi to your friends today. You know, so there's a lot of like built in structure and how to be a good community member um, and then then that actually gets then repeated by kids and, and caregivers like throughout the throughout so like if somebody forgets to say thank you like 20 people jump in and like don't forget to say thank you so there's a lot of like kind of built-in community um, infrastructure around how what a good citizen looks like in this community and that kind of just gets reiterated over and over again as as you play um, one of the big challenges obviously is especially as it's grown larger is um is for some especially older kids the rules are a little bit stifling so as they want to become more mature and, and explore other ideas they've actually had to do an offshoot server for the like the 16 plus crowd so that they can have these more mature uh conversations that that are kind of locked down so so there are some things that are quite limited 
in the autocraft server because they don't they just can't deal with um, the moderation that would be needed for that. So there are some challenges in that um, things are a little bit, you can't, there's a lot of things you can't talk about, like dating, for example, is a big no-no on the main server. And if you bring up dating, you, you get muted for a while and stuff. So there, you know, so as kids grow and want to try on new things, there's some tension there. I see. Thanks. So I think mm -hmm. that one of the issue is like the, when evolving nature of this kind of community, when time goes on, then there's going to be a lot of difference interactions or different uh, perspectives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then and then as kids grow and change and develop, they will have new and different interests that need to be addressed. And whether the community can support that or not is a question. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Saad. Hi, Kate. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was amazing. And I just see so many overlaps with uh, the work that I am interested in too, so I would love to follow up after um, this. But one of uh, the things that I really loved about um, sort of like your your opcraft work is that uh, you know you are uh, including like families and children together, and there's sort of this like multi generational aspect mm -hmm. to. Uh, to the community and also um, I'm guessing that these parents are also learning alongside yes, their children definitely. and I, I would love to because I, I that is actually relevant to the work that I'll hopefully do with the multi-general generational aspect of like mm -hmm. uh, with immigrant and refugee communities yeah. um, especially around mental health uh, mm -hmm. what sort of instances did you see uh, learning happening at the parent and family level? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's interesting because um, one of the interesting things that I saw is that a lot of parents came to Autcraft with their kids and had stories about like, well, my kid was just diagnosed and it turns out maybe I should get diagnosed too. So there's a lot of that sort of intergenerational play where their kids are getting kind of the support and things that happen for kids that are much more supported, especially for autism. And then the adults are finding out that maybe <laughs> they've been autistic all along. And so they are also getting kind of the, they're learning and getting information and support from the community as well. Um, and the the parents actually have their own like back channel where they're all supporting each other and and kind of um i would do i i, I did have a lot of communication on that channel where i where i was talking about my work and so they there is a lot of of kind of that parent support going on but yeah the kids are there learning how to be an autistic person at the same time a lot of the parents were too and so there was kind of that really interesting like the kids are learning all this stuff and then they're sharing it on the server and and it's so there's I would not make any assumption about who who knew what and, and and that sort of thing. Everybody was kind of there together learning all this stuff. Yeah. Great. Uh, we are at time. So let's thank Kate one more time. And, and as Kate mentioned a couple of times, uh, feel free to follow up if yes. you have further questions. Great. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend. Thank you for coming.